My father taught me something. He said, you have to decide in life whether your ultimate goal is to be successful or significant. And what makes you significant in terms of the gospel is very different from what society sees as successful. Because significance for a nation or individual all goes back in as much as you did <laughs> for the least of these. This is In Good Faith, listening to first-person experiences of faith and belief. On In Good Faith, it's our privilege to hear stories and accounts from believers told in their own words. Our hope is to listen with an open heart, celebrating the power of faith and belief and what those stories mean to the ones who tell them. I'm speaking in good faith today with Reverend Dr. William Barber II, who is on the BYU campus today delivering a forum speech titled, Building the Beloved Community. He's the president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach, an organization devoted to improving society's treatment of all of its diverse members. Reverend Barber is bishop with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and is also a pastor in North Carolina of the Greenleaf Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Reverend Barber has continued the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by helping revive and expand a group known as the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. I will be asking about that organization and another one, but first of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking time, Reverend. Thank you so much, Steve. I'm, I'm really honored to be with you um, as we are taping this <laughs> together. I love the topic of your show, A Good Faith, right? Yes. You know, I come from a tradition that my grandmother and my grandfather, uncles, sometimes we'd be in testimony service, and somebody would holler out, have you got good religion? And somebody would say, certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Then somebody would say, do you love everybody? Certainly, Lord. Do you love justice? Certainly, Lord. Do you love praising him? Certainly, Lord. But the, the point is that we need good faith and good religion rooted in what God sees as goodness. And so much of that is, it never loses me that when I open up the Bible, Hebrew, and then the Christian New Testament, over 2,000 scriptures speak to how we ought to live in relationship to the poor, to the least of these, to the vulnerable, and both in terms of privately and publicly and in policy. And that's good, that's good faith, good religion. And if you were to cut all of those passages out, the Bible would fall apart. So I'm glad to be on the show that's talking about good faith, because I come from a tradition where they used to ask us the question, have you got good religion? <laughs> I'm going to say yes, yeah, <laughs> that you do. Before we talk about the organizations and the, the mission and mm -hmm. what you're organizing, a few quick questions about that background. You mentioned that on one side of your family, 300 years of Christian ministry added together. On the other side of your parentage, 500 years, mm -hmm. which sort of sounds like you might not have had a choice in <laughs> where you went. You mentioned in your forum address today, running from God and coming to God through that. Do you feel like you chose what you do or... Is this a mission God gave you? You know, life is so multidimensional that I don't think the lines are that easy to be separated. Um, you know, my family, um, as I said on my mother's side, my uncles on my grandfather were Pentecostal apostolic ministers. My father's side, Congregationalist Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ. Now, we didn't just have preachers in my family either. <laughs> uh, we had people that were far away from being preachers. But I think that in life, some things choose you. Then you're offered an opportunity to live into that choice or reject that choice. And then sometimes you are forced to a crossroads where you have to make a choice. And so when people ask me, you know, how did you come to this point in faith, I would say, certainly first and foremost, I believe in prevenient grace, the grace that goes before us before we're ever looking for it. That grace is often represented in the people, like in my family, my father, my grandparents, and all, that faith was, was after me, grace was after me in them and through them, and I didn't even realize all that was happening. But I also believe that there are moments that, that, that you just come into grace moments. Paul talked about, he said, if you really want to know the truth, I'm a sinner above sinners, but grace, mercy. I often tell people I'm a mercy baby, a grace baby. 
because sometimes when I was younger, you know, I tried to prove I wasn't a preacher's kid. You know, I went through those struggles. I, you know, I went through the struggle of being in honors classes and people would say things like, you're trying to act, quote unquote, white. And so sometimes there was mm. a rebellion to that. Or you're the preacher's kid. And so people wouldn't even invite you to a movie. I mean, they acted like you were just some alien. And so sometimes just for the purpose of having friends, you would try to do things to show, look, I'm one of y'all as well. Until yeah. you grow enough in the faith to find, to find out you don't have to change yourself and be something different. You can be who you are, and God can love you and use you. So I don't know, Steve. I, I always struggle with that question. I don't think I'll be able to answer it for many, many years to come. I know there were choices made long before I even existed by God, by the Spirit. You know, I was born two days after the March on Washington. August 30th, 1963. My mama, my daddy didn't go to the march in Washington because I was supposed to be born on the 28th. My mother said that I was always kind of hard-headed. I stopped coming on the 28th and said, let's <laughs> wait a minute and see what happens <laughs> at this march in Washington. You know, I was born 15 days before white supremacists were blowing up little girls in Sunday school. I often think about what did my mom and daddy say? What kind of world have we brought this baby into? That they're now blowing up children in Sunday school, and then in less than another two months, they were killing presidents. I was born in a time of tears and pain. The only memory I have prior to five years of age is the memory of screams in my house, and I came to know later when I was doing some counseling that it was the day King was killed, and my mother was just screaming at the TV, and my father was crying in the house, and it, it, it so put a impression on me. For a long time, I didn't understand why I cried so easily. And, and I, I came to see that I was, my mother carried me in a time of tears. You Think about 1963. You got George Wallace, segregation yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You got Mega Evers being killed. You got students being shot on the campus of South Carolina State. You know, you've got all this violence. Then you have this massive movement. You got dogs being sick on children in Birmingham. It's all on the TV. And then after the movement where King said for almost a moment, it seemed like the kingdom had come. And then the next day, four babies are blown up. So I think things happen before we ever come to choose us. We didn't have to make choices. We sometimes make the wrong one. Thank God for the grace of God that even when we turn wrong, left, he can turn us right. As my grandfather used to say, God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. <laughs> what I will say is I'm thankful that where I am now and what I understand now and whatever choices were made, choices that I made, wrong choices I made that God corrected by his power and his spirit, I'm just thankful to be a servant. Reverend, you just spoke to an arena full yeah. of people and people watching on TV and people who hear this interview. And I would ask you if I ever could have had the chance to talk to Dr. King. I'd like to ask you the question I would ask him, which is, how do you deal or look past the overwhelming amount of work that needs to be done? Or can you even think about that? Do you just take the next step? All of these people left, yes, fired up, mm -hmm. ready, considering their lives, and some of them will think, this is just so big. This is just mm -hmm. almost too much. And look for how, how to persevere. How do you do that? Well, it is too much, personally, which is why I tried to offer to them involvement in a movement. Mm -hmm. And then I also tried to show them that people in the past faced more than we face now and had less than we have now, and yet they did more with less, and we certainly can't do less with more. But you have to face it. It's one of the things I was studying today. You, you, have to, you can't ignore it. You can't walk past it. You know, one of the things that's different between hope and optimism, because one of the things that interested me about the audience today is, you know, I didn't come with a lot of cliches and playing with young people. I don't believe in doing that. They can handle the truth. They needed the truth. And I felt a deep listening. I wasn't trying to just rah, rah, rah. And when they got to the end, and people were fired up or people were standing. It wasn't over the cute phrases and the way I said no. something. It no. was, I saw people crying and it was out of that. They were actually, I think they got to see the nightmare, but then to also see a way, not around it, but through it. They began to see that the crisis of possibility doesn't have to exist. The crisis of democracy doesn't have to exist. 
that we can have hope, not necessarily optimism. Hope, from a biblical standpoint, never goes around suffering but through it, right? Right mm. through Calvary, right through the graveyard, right through it. It's very wide-eyed and clear-eyed, you know. Jesus does not invite us into a faith that denies the cross. We have too much cross-denying today. Jesus says, take up your cross. You're going to follow me? Take up your cross. And he who will not is not worthy that of you're me. You're not worthy. Jesus started out, first sermon, challenging the constructs of Caesar, put in the forefront of his ministry, the very people that were put on the back burners of, of Caesar's reality. They tried to kill him that day, even in the ghetto in Nazareth. In the end of his ministry, he was doing the same thing, talking about the least deed. But when we look at Scripture, we keep hearing, and this is why I wanted to talk to them today about the need. One thing we have to do is have this mass moral assembly of the remnant, the poor and low wealth people and their allies, moral march on Washington as a declaration, a day of declaration, a day of we won't be silent anymore, a day of saying part of what the rejected in this country, poor and low wealth people must do of every race, creed, and color and sexuality is say, you will not ignore me anymore. You will not, you must see me. And I know they shot Dr. King on the way to doing it, but a lot of times I hear people saying we love Dr. King, but you can't love him and not pick up this part of the work where he said there were three triune evils, racism, militarism, and poverty. Today we say there are five interlocking injustices, systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the, uh, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we have to face it. We have to help the nation to face it. And we can't just do it with people speaking on behalf of people. We have to have the people who are impacted. They are the best messengers. They are the bones in the valley of the dry bones. They are the ones that can be raised up. They have a particular authority and power that comes out of the experience. And in that place is where people see possibility that yes, it's overwhelming, but what if we are together? That's the difference. We've done too much silo work. You know, black folk over here focusing on voting rights, white people over here focusing on climate, labor folk over here working on, when in fact there needs to be a coming together, not in a new organization, but in a movement that does not just have a day, but signals a moral narrative shift that says to, in the middle of an election season, we're not going through any more elections where you can have an entire presidential election or Senate elections in this country and never have one debate on poverty. How do you do that? Mm. How do you just write off 140 million people and just don't even talk about them, just, just talk about middle class and the wealthy, and then claim that we are about establishing justice and then claim that we are people of faith in this country? No, 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 no. So I want folk to feel overwhelmed. I want them to understand the depth of the problem. We, this is not a time for people to feel as though it's okay. That's why I, I know it's not popular, but I agree with David Axelrod and said it before he said it. We should not even be talking about the Build Back Better plan as transformative per se. We should be talking about as responsive. It's an attempt to respond to the, to the problems of the people. It's a part of the response. It's not all of the response. And if spending $1.9 trillion, it ought to be $10 trillion, but that's another story according to the Economic Policy Institute, but if spending $1 trillion over 10 years is the most we have invested in lifting the poor since the Great Depression, that is not a compliment. It actually is a sin. It is a, it is a, it is a sad reality that in the wealthiest nation in the country, we're going to jump and shout about $1.9 trillion over 10 years and so somewhere we have to do the reverse of that movie that Tom Cruise, when the general say, you can't handle the truth. This generation, I believe, is saying we can handle the truth. We're tired of the, the bumper stickers and the quick political commercials. And the, the young man asked me about the, the false separations of liberal and conservative. We, we want to, what's the reality? And then what can we do and engage? And that's what our faith calls us to. God knows I thank God for Christianity. I thank God for a faith that doesn't play with you, that says if you take this up, you got to go by Calvary. 
You quoted several scriptures, including mm-hmm. Luke chapter 4, where mm-hmm. Jesus announces his purpose. Yeah. The Spirit about, of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Greek word, patokos, means those who've been made poor because of deliberate systems of economic exploitation. Healing to the broken heart, recovery of sight to the blind, a liberty to them that are bruised, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord, which is to declare the Old Testament jubilee. And he built that sermon from parts and parts of Isaiah 58, where God says the real fast is all right to fast from food. You should do that from time to time. But I like the way Latter-day Saints fast. They fast and then give the money. To, see, because God right. says fat, real fasting is fasting from wickedness, fasting from injustice, fasting from turning away the poor. That's the only way you can become repairs of the breach. And then Isaiah 61 says the Spirit of the Lord, and Jesus was thinking about all of that. Isn't it something, though, in the ghetto, in Nazareth, in his hometown, when Caesar and Herod had done so much to take away the power of the religious cultists and to say that the 1% and those that Caesar said matter was what's most important, and Caesar said, I'm God, that Jesus says, no, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and upon everybody that follows me in my name to preach good news, evangel. There's no such thing as an evangelicalism that does not deal with the issue of poverty. So how do we read Jesus saying that, stating before he even begins his whole mission, how do we lose sight of that? Why do we not look at that as the main message? Why do we get... (laughs) And there, my brother, is the the question between have you got good religion, good Ah. faith? So much particularly of Western Christianity has tried to isolate spirituality from the politics of God. Dr. King once said, how do we have all these steeples and yet so much struggle? Mm. When Dr. King was in jail in Birmingham, he was challenged by people of faith. You're not really being a preacher now. He said, but Jesus said, the prophet said. (laughs) You know, I've been told that. Why don't you pastor and stop meddling? What do you mean meddling? If I'm a pastor... And the people I pastor are having all kinds of problems because of the policies that exist. It's a form of pastoral malpractice not to seek to change what's breaking their heart. In fact, in that scripture where Jesus said to heal the broken heart, the Greek word for healing there is a word that literally means to heal, i.e. miraculously by the laying out of hands, or to remove the cause of the sickness. Which takes someone acting right. to make that happen. That's right. It takes someone acting to remove the cause of the sickness. And so how do we get away from it? Well, let me give you one hard example. I was just rereading it this morning. Doing the New Deal, this is just one example, because I could talk about it from the standpoint of what Frederick Douglass said, because I love the Christianity of Jesus, I must hate the religion of the slave master. Part of slavery and racism was built on what I call heretical ontology that God intended it this way. So America has had a real theological problem from its existence. But in the 1930s, during the New Deal, major corporations, the United States Chamber of Commerce, were very bothered by the New Deal. And they did a study to find out who had the moral authority in the country. And the study came back and said the pulpits. But the pulpits, most of them were preaching the social gospel like Riverside, the major pulpits were preaching the social gospel, were were saying that the gospel had to be declared and called the nation to repentance in its policies that created the Great Depression and caused all this pain. And Kevin Cruz, who's a great historian at Princeton University, wrote wrote a book called um, One Nation Under the God, and the subtitle is The Purchasing of the American Pulpit. Mm. And he says that the Chamber of Commerce, he names a lot of companies, had a meeting at uh, the Waldorf Astoria with a guy by the name of Finell out of California. He was a Congregationist preacher, and he met with them to tell them he had come up with another gospel. He had come up with a way to debone the gospel, to preach to millionaires and people of wealth. Well, I think the New Testament talks about those who come to you with a preaching a different gospel. Yeah, Paul <laughs> talked about anathema. They, yeah. If you hear another, if you follow another gospel, but he literally said, and he said to them, and you can your audience can read this. This, this document and footnote. He said, if you give me some money, I'm gonna form this organization, and I'm gonna go around and basically purchase pulpits and get preachers all over the country 
into study sessions and teach them to preach this kind of quasi form of distorted Calvinism. Basically says, if you do good, you won't be poor. If you do good, you'll go to heaven. If you do bad, you go to hell. If you do good, you won't be poor. If you do bad, you'll be poor. So then poverty is a basis of personal morality. And inside of about 10 years, he had about 19,000 pulpits. And what he did became the roots, the roots, if you will, of so much other distorted Christianity down through the history of this country, even the Christianity that challenged Dr. King and said that he was wrong in the Civil Rights Movement. But it says, it's as old as Pharaoh having his own religion. It's as old as false prophets of Israel that the kings, I mean, that the real prophets had to challenge. It's as old as the detractors toward Jesus. It's an old phenomenon that keeps being reengaged. And that's why we have to have moral movements to say, wait a minute. Not just to castigate those who promote this kind of distorted moral religious nationalism, but in hopes of challenging them in a way that they will see the error of their ways and will become a part of a deeper moral movement of transformation. But I, I'm confused too, Steve. I, you know, you can go to churches, good churches, people love folk. 52 Sundays out of a year, and even though the number one sin, second only to the sin of idolatry, is how we treat the poor and the least of these, and yet you can go Sunday after Sunday and never hear sermons mm -hmm. that call us to our responsibility in this society to address the systemic evils of poverty. You give a list on the Repairers of the Breach, which mm -hmm. is an organization which yeah, we haven't mentioned right. yet. It's one, of, it's, it's one of the co-sponsors of the Poor People's Campaign. The other is the Kairos Center, led by Dr. Liz Theo Harris, a New Testament scholar at Union Theological Seminary. In the credits at the end, mm -hmm. I'm going to give all these websites yeah. and yeah. a link to your address today. It says, we challenge the position that the preeminent moral issues are prayer in public schools, abortion, and property rights. Instead, we declare that the moral public concerns of our faith traditions are how our society treats the poor, women, LGBTQ people, children, workers, immigrants, communities of color, and the sick, the people whom Jesus calls the least of these. Yeah, the rejected. Yeah. The people that are dismissed. And you know, I love that scripture in Ezekiel where God tells Ezekiel, even if you do this, they might not listen, but at least they'll know there's been a prophet among you. But I also cringe every time I read two scriptures. One in Ezekiel 22, where Jesus says, your politicians have become like wolves. I'm reading this from a paraphrase in the Message Bible. And they have become like wolves because your preachers, your ministers, have told them things that I have not said. And therefore, injustice is epidemic. And then God asked Ezekiel, can I find somebody who will stand in the gap? And the sadness of it is, God then says, I could find nobody to stand in the gap. God says, I need somebody to stand in the gap for the people that are hurting. He couldn't find anybody, and he said, therefore, I have to destroy the nation. But then 15 chapters later, in, in chapter 37, he finds those that, that stand in the gap. But it's the people in the gap. It's the dry bones. They become the hope. The other one is the scripture when Jesus is toward the end of his career, and you, know, you got to pay attention to what folks say when they know they're leaving here. They know it. He <laughs> says, woe unto you hypocrites who tied even a tea leaf, but you leave undone the weightier matters of the law, which are justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So when you look at those parameters, I struggle with, and I was reading that text out of Mosiah 4 today. Yes, from the yes. I struggle with. How does it, people come up with a religion? Of course, it's not new now, because the slave religion did it, and Feinfeld and his folk did it. But the religion that says so much about what God says so little, and so little about what God says so much. So, so you have folk that say, look, if you want to have good religion, just make sure you push prayer in the schools, that you push property rights and tax cuts and a particular party and, and, and this stuff. Well, I can't find that in the sermons of Jesus. I can't find it in the Beatitudes. I can't find it in Jesus' first sermon. I can't find it in his last sermon. I can't find it in the Beatitudes in Luke or Matthew. So how is it that you attempt to say so much about what God says so little 
and so little about what God says so much. And that is part of our moral crisis in this nation. The same way it's a crisis with our, of our Constitution. I hear politicians talking today, and I just sometimes want to throw the Constitution through the TV and hit them upside the head. Because they talk about so much stuff, and I don't never, but that's not what you swore to do. Establish justice. Yeah, and provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare and to ensure domestic tranquility, not division, and to guarantee equal protection under law and to protect voting rights. What in the world? Now, are you just a liar? Or are you under some kind of hypnosis of greed and money? What is it? But something's wrong because what you actually swore to and say you believe is so contra. And, and here I'm not talking about party because our movement challenges Democrats too. Democrats, Republicans, doesn't matter. Because when it comes to the issue of the poor, I dare anybody, go back to the last four presidential campaigns and find me two hours. I know, I know, find me one hour. The last four presidential campaigns, go back and find one hour of debate that was dedicated to the poor. One hour, one debate that was dedicated to addressing the issues by name. And if you find that, I'll quit what I'm doing. You won't <laughs> find it. One thing I, that struck me from your address today was you said words like liberal and conservative. Those words are too puny They're for puny. what we need. Yeah. That there is a morality, whether it's people of faith or people, uh, as you said, who believe in the arc of justice in the universe. Yeah. I'd like to talk just briefly about change because that gives hope. Change mm -hmm. that has happened can give hope. Would you mind telling me, I heard you tell a story about your mother. Mm -hmm which kind of astounds me. I'm speaking to you as a fellow Hoosier. Ah, Hoosier, <laughs> all right, all right. But that they moved back to the South to be part of segregation, and that meant taking you, who was just a child, yeah. and putting you through that. Putting me in segregated what, kindergarten. What, what, they had some sort of faith or some sort of determination. And then you talk about the change over 50 years. Do you mind talking about that? No, and I think... You know, that's why a moral movement has to have three dimensions, just like the prophetic forces have three dimensions. One is you announce the injustice. Two, you announce the doom that's going to happen if you continue that way. But then three, you announce the way out. That's why in the Poor People's Campaign, we don't just curse the darkness. We have a third reconstruction, ending poverty and, and low wages from the bottom up. Twelve steps. In fact, it's a bill. It's actually in Congress now. It's a resolution. We're saying to Congress people, if you're serious about this, you, what resolve? These are the things you have to resolve to do. You have to resolve to do it before you ever write a piece of legislation to do it. Mm. And I named them today, guaranteeing health care, those things. And then these are not liberal. I hate it when people say these are liberal things. Like health care as a universal right was Teddy Roosevelt's idea, who was a Republican. Come on. I don't like those puny phrases because they just have no... No depth to them. It's so easy. It's like cursing because you don't have a language, you know, because you don't have a vocabulary. <laughs> you know, so the best you can do is just a bunch of vulgarity. But my parents, my father, got a Macedonian call from a principal in deep eastern North Carolina. My parents had been through some form of desegregation. And 10 years after Brown, the county that we moved back to, was still operating illegal. Think about that. Supreme Court ruled in 1954. In North Carolina, some part, that we didn't have the kind of desegregation until 1970 with a new case, the Mecklenburg case. So we're going to just defy the law. And he was asked to come back and not only work with the integration, help train teachers and to get ready, but also to work with poor people. We had a pork meal in my community. And they paid people less than they should be paying them. They paid poor whites less than they should be making, and then they turned around and paid poor black folk less than that. And so my father and mother said, we're going to leave. Which kept them from joining together, the whites and the blacks. Because oh, yeah, 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 because the they were played that, against well, each other. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was right, right. At least we're up a step. At least you're not black. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. So low, right. So that's the point. That's why I never talk about racism just in terms of how it affects black people. You know, racism ultimately and systemic policies affect black people, brown people, native people, Asian people, and white people. 
And you have to unpack it that way so that it's not just seen as a black issue. But right, they would keep the wages of black people low and then threaten the poor whites that if we're going to fire you and hire these black people. So that caused many of them to accept low wages and not fight for unions and that kind of thing. But they said they had to go back. And, you know, my parents, my father was double master degree in 1963 and, and earning his doctorate degree and pastoring a church and in the upper echelons of the Christian Church, the Sacks of Christ. My mother was way up in government as an office manager and a, an executive secretary, been a part of the Civil Air Patrol. And my father was, had served in the Navy and given first class service for second class reality in this country and World War II, and they said, but we're going to pack up. And it cost them financially, it cost them in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, it didn't cost them, because my father taught me something. He said, you have to decide in life whether your ultimate goal is to be successful or significant. And what makes you significant in terms of the gospel is very different from what society sees as successful. Because significance for a nation or individual all goes back in as much as you did <laughs> for the least of these. And if I would ever use the word conservative, I don't like to use it because, but I'm very conservative in this. I do believe in the eschaton. I do believe there's a day that we're gonna have to see God and meet God. And I do believe that on that day, people and nations will, be, will not be asked, you know, how wealthy our bank accounts were and how much, how big our portfolios were and how great our cities were and buildings were. But literally this question of where did we stand, as Howard Thurman said, in relationship to the disinherited and the disenfranchised, is going to be centerfold and center place. You know, I've thought a lot about that during, I've thought about death a lot during COVID. I think people ought to think about death long before you die. I did a class in last words when I was doing my doctorate. And they taught, you shouldn't wait till you have to say your last words to say them. Jesus didn't do that. He was prepared. <laughs> he didn't get on the cross and say, let me think what I need to say. <laughs> you know, he prepared. And we need to be prepared. It might be 100 years from now. But you need to think about, what if I had something to say to somebody and it was my last day? Because, look, whether we face it or not, this life is terribly temporary. And during COVID, I thought about that, you know. Like, I know I've been around COVID, somebody. I've had one family in my church lost 12 family members. Wow. Some, somebody in the Poor People's Campaign lost, like, 22 family members within a 30-mile radius in Mississippi. I knew I'd been around COVID. And I know that I didn't catch COVID, not because I'm better than somebody or I have an immune deficiency, you know. So I was asking the question one day when I was kind of um, – engaging in a little mysticism. You know, sometimes I try to imitate Howard Thurman a little bit and some of the other mystics, Gandhi, and I was just sitting and I was talking to Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and and people like that, and um, I was just talking to them. You know, I had some of their books and sayings on the table. I was just sitting in a moment just thinking about, you know, they faced, and, and I said, why am I still here? And somebody said, wrong question. You no, know, I'm serious. My, wrong question. The question is not why you're here, because that's a question you can ask from the first day of your birth. Why were you even <laughs> born? I mean, that's not a big, deep question. You know, why Why are you? I've, I've been in accidents, car turned over five times. So that's the question. You know, I've, I had someone pull a gun on me one time. You know, why didn't they shoot? I mean, you know, I've been arrested numerous times. So they were saying that's the wrong question. The question is, what are you going to do with it? And then I start thinking, yeah, you know, the question, because if COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us that breath is invaluable. The breath of God, ruah, the spirit, or physical breath. And COVID has shown us that there are things that can take your breath away, take it away, and you go away. And so maybe the question is not why am I still here as though there is some moral reason, some superiority reason. But maybe the question is, since I have some breath, what am I going to do with this breath? Because if it's true that all of us are about six or seven minutes from death when it comes to, if we, any of us didn't breathe for six or seven mm. minutes, our organs are going to shut down. Now, you may have some of these divers that learn how to, stay underwater long periods of time, but that's very, very, very rare. Most of us 
six minutes, six minutes, six, seven minutes. So at any moment, we're six minutes away. Maybe the question for all of us in the face of the overwhelming challenges is what am I going to do with my six minutes, my six hours, my six days, my six months, my six years, or my 60 years? And maybe then the answer to that is, Am I going to use my breath to breathe a little more justice into this world, a little more love? Am I going to help breathe energy into a movement? Because I can tell you this, in the midst of COVID, it's never been clear to me that in, in, in any time of my life that to use our breath in the service of hatred and racism and lies and distortions and injustice is a waste of breath. It is a disregard for one of the absolute most valuable things God has given to us. It's a waste. And I'm telling folks, don't waste your breath. Don't waste it. Reverend Barber, is there some one thing or a couple of things that you would say, this is the reason I believe in God, that there is a God? Well, as I said, because I ran away and ran right into it. (laughs) (laughs) Because I am a recipient of God's grace. Like Paul, I declare I have obtained mercy. Uh, my life is a is exhibit A of God's mercy and God's grace. It's very real to me. Um, I believe in the God of Scripture and the God of the Spirit. I know God through the, the Bible says that uh, we overcome through the blood and the testimony. And so the testimony of those before me and even my own testimonies now. Salvation was very personal for me but not private, but very personal. My calling was very personal. I've seen the miraculous hand of God. You know, I've been battling chronic arthritis for 40 years and spent a period of time, 12 years on a walk in a wheelchair, was told I might never walk again. During that time, somehow I still was able to pastor, still able to baptize, still able to do the work I was doing. And one day, I got a prophetic word from one of the mothers in my family that said, God said he's going to give you your ability to walk, but you will never walk full. You'll limp, but it's contingent upon you being reminded to always serve the thing God cares about, which is the thing we talk about in Luke 418. When I preached, when I, was, when I couldn't walk, I never hurt when I was baptizing people and I didn't hurt while I was preaching. I would stand up and feel like somebody had a butcher knife in my hip. When I opened the Word and began to read the Word, nothing. As long as I was preaching, I tell people, maybe one of the reasons I'm so long-winded today. But, uh, <laughs> um, and you know, there's a song that says, yes, God is real, for He is real in my soul. I don't know if we can always fully explain the holy other. Uh, somebody asked a professor one time, prove to us that God is real. And he said, well, let me tell you what I've experienced. And then he said, I want you to come up here and take a bite of this apple. And the person said, what they got to do with proving God is real? He said, take a bite of the apple. The guy said, okay, bit that. He said, is it sweet or is it sour? He said, it's sweet. He said, how you know? He said, because I tasted it. There's some things about God that you don't know until you just walk by faith on the journey. We always live in faith in search of understanding, and yet faith that knows and yet still has places. You know, but one of the great prayers of the Bible is, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I love that prayer because that prayer produced miracles. If you think about it, that was the prayer that got a man's son healed. It was not, Lord, I know you're here. I know you can do it. I know, I know. I don't have any doubt. It was, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And the Bible says that his son was healed. And so I'm still a person of growth. I don't think you can ever know all about God. If you could, you would be God. But uh, I believe in whom I have believed, whom I have professed, whom I have walked with, whom I've seen in the lives and others, the, the testimony of others, the experiences of faith. And I'm continuing every day to, um, as we used to sing in the church, know more and more about this Jesus. But I declare unto anybody I meet, presidents or potentates, I know God is real. 
and I'm going from here to death and beyond with that. I'm, I'm hanging in there. Reverend Dr. William Barber II, thank you for speaking with me today in good faith. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. That's our time for today. Thanks to Reverend Dr. William Barber II for generously sharing his faith and his stories. To learn more about Reverend Barber and his work, go to breachrepairers.org and poorpeoplescampaign.org. To hear his forum address delivered at Brigham Young University, go to speeches.byu.edu and search under his name. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. Email us at ingoodfaith at byu.edu. And if you enjoy the show, be sure you leave a comment or a review where you get your podcasts. Help spread the word. All of our episodes are online at byuradio.org slash ingoodfaith. Our Twitter feed is at ingoodfaithbyu. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you'll join me again soon right here in Good Faith.